Innovation Insights. I'm with Dominic Levine here, co-CEO of Winning by Design. Great presentation uh, th this morning that you gave at the European Energy Venture Fair. And of course, you know, it's all about the science of uh, sales. So why do startups not pay a enough attention to this area? Why is it that it's more of an afterthought or something that comes later? It's not considered in the business analysis of the investment case. Yeah, I think there's two reasons. I think, first of all, most companies are started by engineers, and right. they're very product-centric. Okay. And so they spend an enormous amount of time engineering their product. Okay, yeah. And then they don't realize that they probably should be spending as much time engineering their go-to-market, marketing, right. yeah, sales, course, and customer yeah. success. Yeah. And I think it's a little cultural as well. There really is still a, a sort of rock star, superstar, cult or culture in so companies. So you almost think they don't have it in mind at all when they start and then suddenly they wake up one day and say, I need a sales organization. Do, who do I know in my network? Is that the way? Yeah, I think people are, are thinking of sales as I need to hire a good salesperson. To do it. And then like that an person will bring a, right. a network, okay. will bring a team, will bring yeah. customers. So it's a people-centric yeah. view of sales as opposed yeah. to a, a data or a process-centric yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. view of sales. So, you know, I, I sit on boards of companies, many of the people listening to this uh, conversation also are on board. So what is it that we should be doing to coach those CEOs to change, well, apart from hiring, winning by design, of course, but you know, what should they be paying a particular attention to yeah. you know, when they're thinking about the design so, of sales? So some questions to ask your CEOs would, right. first of all, to try and see, are we running a superstar culture? Right. And a good question to ask might be, what percentage of our salespeople or our reps right. are actually hitting quota? There right. is an epidemic right now in reps uh, okay. not achieving their quotas. And many companies have 80% of their sales come from just 20% of people. That's right. a huge waste of investments. Right. Why can't we have 80% of people produce 80% of revenue and create a predictable right. investment model, right? I put a euro in, a franc in, a dollar in, and I get $10, 10 francs, 10 euros out. So, so if you I were think thinking about an analogy with a sport, what, what would the sales team look like, you know, superstars versus a well-oiled uh, kind of machine? Yeah, well, I mean, I think first of all, uh, yeah. thinking of sales more like a team sport right. would be a good start, yeah, because okay. most of sales is very competitive, right? You might. Well, you almost want that tension between the sales reps. That's almost. what's happening. Yeah. You don't want that, because right. if you think again about a process-driven culture, it's if you improve the process, everybody wins. But that is right. typically not the culture, it's not the compensation model. You know, That's in really organizations. Point, because when you're in an engineering team, you're working together towards a sim, sim, uh, you know, common goal almost, right. right? But in sales organization, it is about kind of what my, what was my contribution? Well, why is that? Is that just the type of characters you have in sales? Or, and, and how do you go about changing them to be more collaborative and right. working with other people and not taking all the glory for, <laughs> yeah. you know, bringing that big deal in the door. Yeah, I think it's really a paradigm shift, right? And yeah. it definitely starts with who you hire. We often right. say that the qualities we look for these days in a salesperson are actually not, you know, what you might think of. It's things right. that so you are, don't want the loners, the No, you the want well team hunters. players, you right. want people that are very customer centric, people that are curious, people yeah. that are empathetic, people that really um, understand the customer. Sometimes we right. actually prioritize those skills over sales skills. So we have a company that's, um, we're helping a company that sells to, um, to truckers, to trucking organizations. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they actually hire the sons and daughters of truckers because they speak the language. You they know, know we, the emotions you were talking right, about. Right, we before, talk about, right? yeah. um, we, we have companies that sell to schools and yeah. they hire former teachers. Okay, right, yeah. to be yeah, yeah, that yeah. actually turns out to be much more important to be successful okay. in modern day sales. So and it's not just about the network, that's just about understanding the issues and what drives the. Right. You know, as you were saying, the kind of emotion uh, of buying something and then you justify right. it. Right, and I think it is yeah. because the customer expectation has changed as well. We right. talked a little bit about the consumerization of the buying experience. 
these days, as a buyer, I do a whole lot of research online before I ever speak to a right. salesperson. Yeah. So what I expect from that salesperson is yeah. very different. That person yeah. is no longer you know, the person who controls the information, but it needs to be a genuine advisor, someone who right. can genuinely help right. me solve my problem, genuinely help me to buy. Yeah, I mean, we've always been in uh, board meetings where you look at the pipeline and it's incomplete or it's not there because people are not putting the information there or they're working with distributors who are also not providing the, the information. How do you get that? You know, describe that blueprint where you can actually build in that kind of transparency and openness mm. to kind of work together. How do you actually create that design? Right. So when you talk about sales blueprints or sales designs, right. there's various elements of levers you can pull. Right. But at the bottom of that pyramid or that design, we yeah. really uh, put process. Yeah. And we made a lot of analogies this morning uh, to uh, manufacturing, to yeah. Six Sigma yeah. And, yeah. and Kaizen and yeah. such. But that starts with defining your process. Right. Once you define it, you can measure it, you can benchmark it, you can find bottlenecks, right. and you can incrementally and continuously improve it. Yeah. But those blueprints get quite uh, detailed. I think many right companies might have heard of a sales playbook and they right, might yeah, go as far yeah. as defining what are my sales stages, what are entry and exit yeah. criteria. Although yeah. there too, I would argue that while many companies have a sales playbook, many salespeople don't follow the sales right. playbook, right? right? They're lone wolves. But if you do have that sales playbook, maybe go one layer deeper and you can go as far as creating a blueprint for an individual a key moment or interaction, yeah. let's say a first yeah. discovery or diagnose call right. with your customer and create a scoring rubric um, so that reps can self-evaluate, right. so that you can see if people are following the process. And once you do that, it unlocks opportunities to maybe A-B test. Or and I think you're, you're doing process. almost continuous monitoring and improvements. Whereas almost the traditional way is you wait until the end of the quarter or the end of the year and then take action, so which is way too late, well, right? Or moreover, yeah. most boards go like, or most VPs of sales or CEOs go like, we yeah. need more sales, what do they do? Right. Ooh, let's go hire a bunch more yeah, salespeople. Yeah, yeah. Or let's go beat up marketing and yeah. ask them for more leads. Yeah. The beauty of this Kaizen model, yeah. right, of this very data-driven model is that it's actually possible with small incremental yeah. improvements we yeah. say, let's find seven small things we can improve. Yeah. Maybe take your close rate from 20 to 22%, yeah. right? These yeah. are minor 10% improvements. But overall, overall yeah. the impact of that, people, we're not good at, at, at understanding compound impact, yeah. but 1.1 to the power of seven yeah. actually is two. Yeah. Or 1.95. Yeah. But basically, <laughs> I've just we I've just doubled. Yeah. Okay. The impact of that is I've just doubled my revenue yeah. without adding a single additional lead Resource, yeah. or yeah. without adding a single yeah. additional yeah. salesperson, yeah. and that's a huge under like sort of leveraged uh, opportunity. So in summary, it doesn't really matter if you're uh, investing in early stage or late stage. It's a process that you have got to design. Uh, into the system in order to achieve the goals and the exit that you're looking for. Dominique, yeah. let's leave it there. Thank you very much for coming to the European Venture Fair for your presentation and your time today. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.